Barb from Duluth. Hi, Governor. Uh, my name is Barb Westberg. I'm the administrator for Essentia Health. And uh, we provide care for mentally ill and sometimes very dangerous patients who are state committed individuals. In essence, they are a ward of the state. And what happens in our state is over time we have less and less resources for people with this level of mental health disease. And so I know currently what's on the table as a proposal, as an expense reduction, is the elimination of the Moose Lake grant. And what that is is subsidy fund that comes to just a few of us in the state that have stepped up to provide longer term care while we're waiting for a bed in a state facility. And I know on the background paper you listed several sites that you believe um, provides care to this level of patient. But in reality, the only place that will take patients with behavioral uh, challenges like this is ANOCA. And on many occasions, we are waiting up to 45 days for ANOCA to be able to have a bed open to take these patients. And so again, I just ask that you reconsider this line item, the impact that it can have on our hospitals to our inpatient program, and really the impact that it'll have on this very vulnerable group of patients. This is a grant from the Department of Human Services to the Moose Lake operation? Um, the, it's a grant from the Department of Human Services to hospitals. And there's about five health systems in the state of Minnesota that again have stepped up to try to provide this bridge between the acute hospital and then when the state is actually ready to take the patients. Okay, well, I'll look into it and again, if you like, sir, if we would like Commissioner uh, Human Services Cindy Justin to talk with you directly, but I'll ask her to tell me about it. I mean, I thank you for your willingness to step up and they got, I mean, we have a, you know, enormous increase in the number of people who are, you know, depending on state to care uh, for mental challenges. I have a nephew who's autistic, so I, you know, I've lived through this through my sister and we have 80, um, no, I'm sorry, we have 200 now, approximately 200 state uh, operated facilities that have over 85,000 people in them, and they're full. And as you say, you know, it's a backup because uh, Minoka can't place people who are ready to move on. They don't have the transitional programs, and that's, you know, a real boy. So then you're backed up, and then um, Hamilton County Sheriff uh, Richard Stanick says that he has uh, 10,000 people, a, no, I'm sorry, 30,000 people a year in the county jail, and a third of them are mentally ill. So, I mean, we got this huge, you know, untreated, you know, number of people, and the system is really bogged down. And, you know, again, we're trying to find out where, where do we find all the resources to keep doing what we've been doing so far, much less expand. And it's a real challenge. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate very much you doing it. I certainly don't want to you know, take away your ability to provide that uh, support. You know, thank you for doing so, and we're looking the right way. And please give Sarah your number one back to Governor, I have Jody from Cloquet back here. Hi, thanks for taking the question. Uh, we're talking on behalf of Minnesota College graduates in the field of education, <coughs> and we're wondering if you could comment on the recent change with taxpayer money going towards teacher licensure and the shift from the practice to the MTLE and with the uh, increasing number of students having difficulty passing the test. Um, wondering if you can comment on that and what will be done to assist those students. Well, I, I defer to a uh, really terrific commissioner of education, Brenda Casselli. She thinks the test changes were unfair. And we're trying to work that out in this current session and hopeful that they will do so uh, because you know, we, the last thing we want to do is have an same thing with testing of kids. You know, you have an unfair test, it produces unfair results and it causes a lot of trauma in people's lives for no good reason. So. I put the same in this category, and you know, there's a, a fixation that some of the legislature, uh, I'm not, and one of them, I voted against the uh, No Child Left Behind. Nine of the ten Minnesota members of Congress, including all the, the three Republicans at the time, voted against No Child Left Behind. So uh, we had a sense that Minnesota could do it better, uh, but you know, the national view at the time is still in, in both the federal and state mandates. I mean, the testing thing is just, you know, beyond the pale. Uh, in terms of the alternative licensure, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think we opened the door for people to have, find another way they could become involved in teaching. I don't think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a very small percentage of those who are 
going to be in the teaching profession 10 years from now and beyond. Um, you know, I, so I, I think it's uh, it's got reasonable criteria, and we can find some you know, dedicated people at your age who, who want to <laughs> join Teach for America and get some experience, and then become part of our you know, excellent teaching core. Then you know that uh, we want the best and the brightest, however they can come through. Got Teresa from Duluth. The unfair part for you is is you know young ones, young people now is you know I don't know a friend who's five five schools in three years. I mean. And you can't establish you know, that base, so that's that's unfair. Thank you, Governor Gaten, for coming this far. And I'd like to also thank my colleague from Essentia for asking about that grant. It's very important. And I actually work with folks with developmental disabilities and mental health concerns. And part of um, that uh, statement that came out saying that we were going to use some of that Moose Lake funding for our hospital beds also included a change to the community support services which is another one of those frontline pieces of services that we give to people who have very serious behavioral needs. And um, our understanding is that we're going to actually lose access to our state-operated community support services in, in 2014. I, I use our local regional team all of the time for my clients, and it actually prevents hospitalizations. So I'm kind of wondering, what the theory is there and why we would do that. Um, you know, I don't know why we would, and my other question is, some of those services are provided through Medicaid waiver dollars, but there's also a state allocation so people who aren't under waivers can use those services and they're paid through Medicaid. So it's a, it's a, I hate this word because it's thrown around so much right now, but it is considered an entitlement for somebody who's in crisis. So I'm wondering, what, what is going to be the crisis plan in the future? I've watched the desert of the state hospitals and the crisis plan right now doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, you just demonstrated that. And this feels like a further ratcheting down of the crisis services. Well, uh, when I made a mental note next to these meetings I have around the state, uh, Commissioner of Human Services, Cindy Jessen, is going to be joining us. So. <laughs> and I will ask her to come up if you, you get, get your name is Sarah, and there's a group of you concerned about the, you know, the, the uh, Moose Lake situation and the funding uh, reductions that that's the case for crisis care, care facilities. And I'd be glad to ask her to come up and meet with a group you would assemble and talk about it. And, you could apprise her more if she can explain whatever is going on and then she can also explain it to me, which I'll ask her to do. So get yeah, give your number to Sarah, be glad to that, glad to do that. Governor, this is Jill from Two Harbors. Hi, Two Harbors. Thanks for being here, Governor. Um, my question has to do with um, children with disabilities. I have two children with disabilities. And I was wondering specifically what your budget has in store for children and young people with disabilities. Well, as you know, there's a spectrum of, of disabilities, so I, it's, you know, the, the various, we put additional money in for autism, $12 million, and I'm going to send a letter to uh, the Secretary of Human Health and Human Services in Washington asking that you know, autism services be made part of the basic care package under the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, the funding overall is, uh, I believe, you know, it starts at the same level that it was reduced to this funding, and, and we've got cut uh, increases in there, and I, I, I can't give you the specifics, we'll get them to you, but we put some modest you know, improvements, but again, we did. If we didn't have, a, if we hadn't, didn't have to pay off the school districts 1.9 billion, uh, which we owed them, and so we should have paid, should pay, have paid them, we did, this last uh, two years, uh, that money would have gone into the next biennial budget, and we'd have a $1.3 billion surplus instead of a $627 million deficit. And then when you look at things like, you know, the services for people in crisis, people with disabilities, which haven't also cut, you know, over the last decade, and we could, you know, make those uh, improvements. Hopefully in two years we'll be at that point. We'll hopefully pay off the school, the rest of the school shift. It's another $800 million. As I said, we paid off $1.9 billion already. We start the next... Um, by any of them having paid for the deaths of the past, then we can, can do some of these things. And so, you know, it's, uh, I'm well aware, Cindy Jess is well aware of, you know, that every one of those dollars goes to help somebody. Governor, I've got Kathy from Duluth. 